Spaghetti, 30 secondi e cominciamo. Ok, so, let's welcome Radomir. Now everybody knows who he is and which talk is that, because I have repeated it six times until now. So, welcome. Okay, thank you. I'm going to tell you about the magical attributes in Python. Those are all the attributes uh, that start with uh, double underscore and end with double underscore. Uh, there is one clarification. First, I will be talking about Python 2, mostly 2.7. There have been several changes in Python 3. I will try to point them out, but I can't promise you that I will remember. So uh, this talk is about Python 2.7. If you need uh, to see the differences, most of uh, information in this, talk, in this talk is from the uh, Python's data object uh, model documentation. So they, uh, so, so if you need uh, to reread something or cl uh, clarify something, just go to the documentation. Most of the things are there. Some of the things I had to check or uh, look into the source code to, to be sure how they work, but those are mostly uh, small details. Uh, second thing is I will be talking about new style classes. The old style classes uh, behave a little bit different under under and and uh, I don't won't have time to to tell about that. Uh, there will be some simplifications. I will be showing you code that kind of does what Python actually does, but it will be simplified. It won't be uh, taking care of the all all the corner cases because I want it to be simple, easy to understand. And finally, this is a half hour talk. I won't cover all the attributes that I would like to cover. It's not comprehensive. There are lots of other attributes there uh, that are also very useful and interesting, but it won't fit in this presentation. So that's that. We'll start with collections, and uh, they, have, they have a lot of useful uh, magical attributes, but those are the most commonly used. And, uh, well, the easiest way to explain how code works is to show the code. So I, th throughout this presentation, I, I will be showing you code that explains how Python internally interprets uh, the, the different uh, things that you tell it. So basically, if you call a len on something, it will just call the dunder. Oh, by the way, dunder is a short for double underscore. And so basically, len calls len, in calls contains, and not in is basically a not for, for the in. So that's, that's simple. Uh, when you use the square brackets, it's, it calls get item, set item, and del item, depending on the context. That's also very easy. Uh, when you use square brackets with, with the slice notation, with the uh, columns, it depends actually how, what the object that you call it on has. If it has the get slice uh, method, which is deprecated, or set slice or del slice, depending on, on what operation you are doing. So if you didn't provide the step and it has a get slice, it will call, call that. But before it will call that, it will normalize the uh, parameters that you pass. So as you can see, it will make sure uh, well, if it's not there, it will be. Z if the start is not there, it will be zero, and if it's negative, it will add the length of your collection. And the same way with end. If it's not there, it will be max int, which is kind of arbitrary actually, because Python is not limited to max in 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 what size of the numbers you can use. But this is all the old interface, so. And, and also it will be get uh, fixed if it's uh, negative. And 
it will call the get slice or set slice or del slice, depending on what you are doing. One uh, thing to remember, this doesn't guarantee that it will be positive. So it may still be negative when it gets to your, to your method. And that's the deprecated way, because right now it will just create a slice object from those parameters that you pass, and will pass it to, to get at uh, or set at or, or, or del at like, like before. Yes. Uh, so you can just check if it's a slice object and then handle it how, how you want. One of the most powerful things in, in Python that really uh, make it simple to, to write programs is the iterator protocol. And when, when you, for example, when you write a for loop, this is what, what Python will do uh, behind the scenes. It will take your sequence and uh, create an iterator out of it. I'll at least try to create an iterator out of it. And that it does that by, by calling the iter method on that. The iter method is supposed to return an iterator for, for that particular collection. Then it will iterate uh, in a loop and keep calling next on that iterator to get the next element from the collection. And it will keep doing that until you write a stop iteration exception. When you do that, it will just exit the loop. Uh, of course, you can have an else clause in the for loop and, and things like that and break and continue, so that's not uh, handled in here. But this is the basic idea. So to make something iterable, you just put an iter method on it and make it return the iterator. Usually, you just make this iter method a, a, a iterator generator itself. So just yield things from it. Uh, when you make your own dict object, dict-like object, apart from the get at and uh, get item and set item and del item uh, methods, there are a lot of useful methods in the dict, like like update or or I don't know uh, Husky and, and stuff like that. And reading them all by hand is a lot of boilerplate. So you can just make your object uh, inherit from this uh, dict mixing, and that will let you, it will use the basic methods that you already have to implement all the rest of them. So you don't uh, have to write them themselves. Of course, they won't be optimal, but you can always add your own optimal uh, implementations later. OK, let's go to attributes. This is the most complicated part, so brace yourself. By the way, if you, feel, if you are not confused, if you feel like you understand everything, you are not learning. So confusion is a good thing. OK, so when you access something on an object through the dot operator, it actually calls get attribute on that thing. And we will get to the details of get attribute in a moment, because that's a little bit complicated. And when you set some value, it will call set at. And it will only check for set at on the class of this thing. So if you have an object and you just monkey patch a set at on it, that won't work. It has to be on the class of the object. Actually, a lot of uh, those magical attributes uh, have to be defined on the class, not on the object directly. Uh, so that's kind of a safety mechanism so that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Also, it's faster that way. And, well, the implementation is pretty straightforward. If there is a set at, it will call the set at. Otherwise, it will do the default thing. So what you expect, it will add, add the value to the dict of that object. And it will only add the value to the local dict. It will never modify the things that you inherit from. 
So all modifications are only on the object that you are actually modifying. And the same is with Dell, so that, that's pretty straightforward. Get attribute is a little bit more complicated because uh, it has to check all the classes from which you inherit. So first it will check if there is uh, if there is your the, the name you are trying to access if it is in in the dict of the attribute that you have directly. If it is, it will just return that immediately. No, no questions asked. Uh, of course, you can you can override this get attribute to have your own uh, behavior. But if you don't, then it will check all the classes that you inherit from, and it will uh, check the, their dicts. And if it's there, it will return that. And finally, if it doesn't find it in uh, in the object and in the classes it will call get at. So you can override only this to handle the missing attributes. If you only want to handle the attributes that are not there on your object directly, then just define get at. If you want to have control over all attribute access, you override get attribute. OK. And That was a lie, actually, because those methods are much more complicated. So there is the so-called descriptor, uh, descriptor protocol in Python. And there were probably already talks about uh, this descriptor protocol, and they were covered in detail. But let's just quickly look at what, how it works. So. The part that is different is when the attribute is on the class itself. It doesn't uh, when when it's on the object directly, it doesn't change. If it's on the class, uh, it will it will still look for the attribute on that class, and if it's there on that class, it will check if the attribute has a get method. If there is a get method, instead of returning the attribute that it found it will call that get method and return that. So that's how, for example, property works. Instead of, of uh, getting the, the property object, you are, you, it, it calls the accessor on that property, the get method. And it's the same for set at and del at. It's, it just looks very complicated because uh, I had to slap this uh, class searching code in there because they didn't have it initially. And mm, it's set and actually I can scroll that and delete. So they do the same stuff. And this is very powerful and I will show you that a lot of Python internals is actually based on these descriptor protocols. So for example, object methods are also descriptors. Functions are descriptors. So there is an example of how you can make your own property decorator that will do a simplified version of what the real one does. Basically, you just have a class that has a get method and it calls the your decorated function, so the, the function that you decorated. And if you use it like this, you get the same thing that property would give you. OK. And you can also see how, uh, how get takes the instance uh, of, the, of the object that you are accessing and the class on which it was actually defined. So you can have, you can, for example, call other uh, things on this, on this class. And when you actually access the attribute on the class directly, the instance will be known. You only get the owner. Let's go to functions. So when you call a function, this is a little bit uh, awkward because, yeah, when you call a function, Python actually calls the call method of that function. 
but you can see this is uh, kind of starts all the way down. So this actually happens in C code. So it's not like this directly. But if you examine a function object, if you dir, uh, run dir on a function object, you can see that it actually has a call method on it. So it's internally working like that too. And you can put a call method also on your own objects, on your own classes, and even on modules. So you can have a callable module. It, it just works. Uh, one important thing, uh, because there are a lot of uh, magical attributes on a function like doc string and module name and its uh, uh, package name and, and things like that. When you are making a decorator that wraps that function, you and, and returns an, a different function, the, the, the wrapper. The wrapper usually don't, doesn't have all those attributes. So it's important to use this uh, decorator that will copy all the doc strings, module name, and things like that into your new function so that, uh, for example, Flask views will, will still work. It's especially important if, if you have some code that uses the function name later on. OK, as you know, Python has closures. So you can define a function inside another function. And that inner function has access to the, variab to the local variables of the outer function. Uh, here is an example of a simple closure. Uh, if you run this, uh, we have a function factory. We call it two times to create two different functions. And if you look at the results of calling them, you can see that each of uh, those functions has its own copy of the variable variable. And uh, that's because every time you call function factory, a new function scope is created in memory. And it has to be kept for the inner function to work, because the inner function uses that variable. So the closure is actually kept on the function object itself. It's called in under uh, closure uh, attribute, and uh, you can actually look at it. It's full of cell objects, and cell objects are a way of encapsulating those, uh, kind of keeping a reference to those variables inside a different uh, scope. The way methods are implemented using the scripter protocol. So you probably have noticed that when you pass a method around, for example, to a, as a func function parameter, it actually brings its object with it. It may seem like the obvious thing to go do, but for example, JavaScript doesn't do that. In JavaScript, there is a lot of uh, hassle when, when you have to pass the method, but also you have to pass the object somehow, so it knows on what, which object to call the method. In Python, that's automatic, and that's because of this uh, descriptor protocol. So basically, whenever you access a function through, um, through the dot notation, it doesn't return you an, uh, the function itself. It gives you a wrapper object that <laughs> Uh, this bound method object that keeps a reference to the self, to the object it was called on, well, it, it was taken from. So when you and when you call it, it will actually call it with with self as the first argument. So that's how it's done internally. And if you access it on the class, you will get this unbound method thing that that has actually this logic that does it. So it's important to remember that this bound method object is created at the moment when you use the dot operator. And usually that's transparent. But if you, for example, have a, mm, when you have a list of callbacks on some object and you use weak references, to store them, because you 
don't want to for for the callbacks to to keep the object alive when the when nothing else is referring to that object. Uh, so it's it's wise to use weak references. But then if you add to this list the bound methods, not just functions, but bound methods of objects, they will disappear instantly. Because they were created at the moment you used the dot operator and there is no other reference to them. Because they are special objects just for, for this uh, instance of, of, the, of the object. So it's, it's you, you have to actually wrap them in, in an additional object or, or something like that to, to keep them alive. Okay, let's go to the object life cycle. Uh, there are the three important uh, methods you, you have on an object. Uh, the new, how new actually works. It will... First, it will try to create an instance of your object and it will do it by calling the new operator of the, uh, of the class you are, that you are using. And that actually goes all the way up to object because we are talking about new style classes. So if you don't have a new on your class, it will go to the super class of that and, and so on until it reaches the new of the object itself and it will create an instance of that. And if that new method returns an ins actual instance of, of the class you are creating, it will also call init on it. But you can, of, of course, overwrite new, and you can make it return anything, like a dict or, or an int or a string or anything. And then, of course, it won't call init on it. So that's that. That's that. Uh, and that's also implemented through a call method on, on the class itself. So if you examine a class object, you will see that it, that it has a call method. Uh, a couple of notes on Dell. I won't explain. Well, it's supposed to, to remove it's supposed to be called when, when all references to your object are gone. So when it's being garbage collected, basically, uh, just before it's be garbage collected, Dell is called. But uh, because you don't really know when that happens. In C Python, it usually happens when there are no more references to the object. But if there are cycles, it may happen later because uh, cycles won't be garbage collected by the reference counter, it will be garbage collected by the garbage collector. And if it's Jyton on Iron Python or, any, or PyPy, uh, you don't know. You really don't know when that's going to be called. And you don't know what you have available, because, for example, it may be called at the end of your program when everything is being garbage collected. <laughs> And, for example, the sys module might have been already garbage collected. So you cannot call sys path and things like that. Uh, so you really don't know what you have available. So you should really just do the minimum code if you really must use Dell, of course. All exceptions in that code are ignored because it's called outside of the execution flow of your program. There is no way to throw in an exception and, and to catch it somehow. So exceptions are ignored, warnings are printed directly to the standard output. You cannot intercept that anyway. And uh, one more reason to not use Dell, to really think twice before you use Dell. Uh, if you have, because CPython at least, uh, has two mechanisms for collecting, for, for garbage collecting uh, objects. One is the reference counting, and that works if you don't have any cycles. 
if you have a cycle, you have, for example, uh, an object and A that references B and B that references A, they will still have reference count of one even if nothing else references them. So they will, would stay in the memory forever. That's why Python has an additional mechanism that once in a while looks through the, all the objects in memory and, and actually I think it uses mark and sweep algorithm to, to get rid of them. And how it gets rid of them is that it breaks one of the, of the references that the objects have to each other. So it's, it forces garbage collection of one of those objects. The problem is if you have Dell, it cannot do that because it doesn't know if you need the other objects in the Dell method itself. So it won't do that. So if you have Dell, those objects will stay in memory forever until you stop your program. So be careful with Dell and really don't use it if you don't really need it. Okay, classes. Uh, there are lots of interesting attributes on, on the classes. I will briefly cover just those. And meta class, it's kind of a scary thing in Python, but it's really simple. Uh, the scary things are how you can use it. Thank you. And uh, when you define a class in Python, when you type this class uh, statement, what happens actually is this code. So uh, Python calls the type Met, uh, type uh, built in uh, with, with uh, the name of your class, the list of uh, subclasses that it in, uh, superclasses that in, inherits bases, and uh, the dict of objects that you actually put in the class definition. If you have been to the SQL Alchemy talk uh, two days ago, uh, it was actually explained in the, the the guy showed how SQL Alchemy uses that internally, uh, and he showed that actually it doesn't have to be type. It's the type of the object. I mean, uh, it's type because object is of the type type. So it it actually calls the the class of the super class. That's that. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can use that, for example, to have a, this is a horrible example, but it's simple at least. Please don't do that in real code. You can have a class that produces you dicts. You can use the class uh, uh, syntax to have a dict. And how you do it is just you make this uh, function that takes the name, takes the basis, and takes the dictionary, ignores everything that it took, just dele deletes the meta class attribute because uh, that's how you pass it to, to your class. So you don't want it there, and returns the dict. And uh, that actually, instead of a class, this will produce you a dict. This is a very powerful thing. Uh, you can, you can customize everything in your class using that. And uh, I actually prefer to use uh, class decorators when I can, because they are kind of easier to understand, easier to explain. But you can do what, what you would do in a class decorator. The thing that you cannot do with class decorator is to do something before you create the class. So, for example, you couldn't do this with class decorator, right? Uh, actually, you do. You could because you would return the dict of the class, but the class would still be created at some point, so you would throw that away. And in Python 3, uh, the syntax for meta class is completely different, and you can also uh, have this prepare uh, method that tells you what should be that, because in Python 2, this D is always a dict. And in Python 3, you can make it an order a dict, for example. That could be useful. Or, or whatever you want. So you have this prepare method that actually creates this dict before it's, it gets populated. That's also pretty cool. 
Okay. Uh, another thing, you can, you have a control over how its instance works, because its instance will check for this instance check uh, method, and if it's there on the class, it will use that instead of checking if it's actually the instance of of the class you are looking for. And uh, the same thing is for uh, its subclass. You can also control subclass, and that's actually how APCs are implemented in Python. They are implemented practically in, in pure Python. There is no magic in there. Actually, well, there are a lot of magic attributes in there, but... Uh, okay, operators. This is uh, just a quick view. To get the full list, look into the documentation. You can override them to change how the object uh, handles that operator. And... Uh, for example, you can use it to make this kind of uh, uh, operation recorder uh, object. That's how SQL Alchemy does its uh, does the filter method. Because you, you can to the filter method you can pass expressions that involve the the field uh, object, and the field object has code like this uh, actually inside that records what operations you are calling on it. And it always returns itself, well, itself, it, it wraps itself in, in, in objects that represent those operations. Uh, so the result of this code, you can create an A and B and then do some operations on it. And if you print them, uh, you can see that I also over, overridden the rep to, to actually go through recursively through to all those wrappers and, and print them in a in a nice form. So if you need ever need to to create your own uh, domain specific language that has any any calculations in it, you can use that. That's a pretty neat trick. Uh, comparisons. Okay, one thing is uh, hash. Uh, for an object to be, if you want to use an object as a key in a dict, or as a, or as a member of a set, it has to need this hash, because it tells it how to how to uh, where to put it in the dict, basically. And uh, the only well, it's it has to be an int, and if the objects are equal, the hashes has to be. Equal. Ha have to be equal. That's the only uh, thing that you need to do with this hash. And they are identical. Actually, when they are equal. Should be be? Okay. I, I, I will check that later and, and maybe I meant the, the slides will be available. So. Probably, okay, I have to check that in, in the code, because that's, okay. And uh, the default hash method, all the objects that you create have the default hash method, and it's the ID itself. So different objects, uh, different instances will, no, that's why it, it's not is. The default is like that. But you can have two objects uh, hashing to the same value if you consider them equal in your logic. Uh, okay. And I won't go into details about this comparison uh, uh, metric methods. It's just one one nice decorator in the func tools uh, module. If you just define equals and later then. This uh, decorator will define all the rest for you using the total ordering, mathematical principles, whatever. It will work as you expect normal objects to, as, as numbers work. So that's also a neat trick. So thank you. And uh, and now. Questions? 
thank you for the talk. So one thing which I noticed uh, many times by mistake is that not equal, the, under, the dunder not net neck is now defined by default as not yes. ek. So that happened to me very often to say why, why it's not working, yes. why it's not working, and then is that, do you know the reason why it was done like this? Well, because it's not necessarily that, in depending on your object. For example, the none object is never equal and is never not equal to anything. Yeah. Okay. It also always uh, returns false both for equal and for non-equal. So it, the, for for numbers. We have some intuition that not equals and equals should be negations of itself. Mm -hmm. But for different objects, it's not necessarily true. So that, that's why you have this uh, decorator to, to define all the stuff you need, and that just works. OK. Thanks a lot. More questions? Okay. Oh, sorry. Also look it up. Um, uh, closures, they work differently in some Pythons than other because you cannot assign to stuff in your closure. Or, right? I, I think so. I might be confused. No, I think you can always assign uh, to stuff in your because because those are just variables pulled from the upper uh, scope, so there are normal variables. Uh, I don't know of. Uh, you can use a list, like in your example, that would work with mutable objects. But I think yes. there were some restrictions, so I, but I might oh, be confused. Oh right, uh, because they are. If if you just do. Uh, variable equals something, it will create a local variable that will sh shadow the one from the outer scope. Right. And in Python 2, there is no way to import a variable that is not global and not local in to your scope, to your scope. In Python 3, there is a, the non-local keyword for that, and they fixed it. You can actually do that. And in Python 2, you are right. You cannot do that. Thank you, Radomir. Do you or anyone has a valid reason to use Dunder Dil Dil Dunder D E L? No. no, I don't know of anyone who actually needs that. I know that it's needed on, on things like file when you want to close the file uh, when when you are done with it. But uh, really, you can easily get around without that and, and use uh, the Wikref module has some tools that let you uh, do tricks without having to use Dell and still have some finalization for your for your objects. Context manager maybe. Yeah, yeah context managers and, and things like that and uh, Dell is really, really, uh, it's a hack and uh, it's it hurts sometimes in strange ways if you use it. So, so really, you shouldn't use it lightly. And I don't know of anybody who actually needs it. So it's needed inside the Python itself. And since it was there, they made it available because that's the philosophy of Python to empower the, the, the users. But you sh it's easy to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> we hate them. <laughs> okay, if we've got one quick question. No? Okay, thank you very much again. <laughs>